In which point? Yeah, but, wait, it, it, that's going to be x in my case, and then the rest is negative. Yeah. Um, before we begin, just a correction on the last, the last problem. Um, uh, what was the answer we got again? Was it 4 pi a cubed or something? Oh, okay. It should be positive, right? Yeah, it should be positive. So, what is the answer for the last? What is for? I'm going to talk about it. Uh, for my <coughs> no, Homer's not due to oh, Really? Um, who can tell me where my error was? Yeah. Put a negative sign in front of what? I'm just kidding. Maybe the orientation of the... Possibly. The what? The orientation. Or it could have been an error I tell me specifically what was the problem. Why, what went wrong? And how you would know that it was wrong. You got the wrong orientation? Yeah. What does that mean? You chose it negative instead of positive. What does that mean? Negative what instead of negative positive? Negative vector. Was negative instead of positive. Yeah, right. I don't know. I was thinking. Come again? It wasn't an error problem. I was finding a flux. Flux. You don't care about sign. I think it was flux that we were finding. Yeah, yeah, it was flux. You don't care about negative and positive. That doesn't matter. Flux can be negative. You, you most likely got the wrong normal vector. How do you know it was the wrong normal vector? By thinking about it. How do you know? The vector should be pointing outwards. That's the that's the and if, if, if they point outwards, then it must be positive because it's a, it's a flux field. But no, outward does not be positive. Here I have a lower half of a sphere. Vectors are pointing out and it's down. I'm not saying up and down is positive. I'm saying the normal vector is in positive orientation when, when they're pointing away from the center. Yeah. Right, so what was the problem? You were pointing inward to the center. How do you know? Because, because, oh, I'm thinking about it. You, you, you look at the normal vector and you see how it's pointing. <laughs> Right. Basically, you have to look at the normal vector and see how it's pointing. Now, when I was doing this and working it out for my notes, I just happened to cross the normal vector in the right order, and I was like, okay, it's fine, and I just went through. When I was doing it in class, I, I did the cross the opposite way, which obviously mm. gives you the negative of oh, what the original cross yes. would be. But because when I was doing it in my notes, it was fine, I didn't think to check it. But then I realized, oh, I got the negative of the answer. What was wrong? It was the normal vector. How did we know if you look at the z-coordinate? So it's not that important matter, it's how it looks like when you think about it. And okay. should be. Like one way, you're, you're thinking in practical terms how you can do a quick check, right? So my quick check was to just look at the z coordinate. N should have been the negative of what it was. Note the z component. What was the z component in our vector? Uh, I think it was negative a squared sine c. No. Yeah, and then cosine c squared. Negative what? Neg I think negative a squared sine c cosine c squared. No, no, not squared. Sine c cosine c. Yeah. Okay, so you look at that guy, right? Yeah. And you look at, we were doing the whole sphere. So if you look at the whole sphere, you know that anything in the upper hemisphere, for example, should be pointing up if you're going out. But what, do you, what does it mean to be in the upper hemisphere? What is the range on the phi values? be from uh, uh, height of no, no, 0 to 2. 0 to 2. Now, what is the sine of sine and cosine in this range? Well, it's just plugging 0 to 
do an easy check. So you would get no, 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 no. They're both positive, yeah. right? Your sine right. looks like this, right? Your sine is positive between zero and pi. Yeah. Your cosine looks like this, right? Yeah. Cosine okay. is positive that's between that's zero that's and pi over two. These are both positive in this range. Yeah. But I take the negative of a square times the positive number. That gives me a negative number. It means that the vector that we had, the z coordinate was pointing down. Which again illustrates one of the reasons why I don't like using crossbars, because you really have to pay attention. When you take the crossbars of your normal vector, you really have to like examine the normal vector. It's not always going to be a standard, because it's going to matter which direction you take the crossbar in. So after you do the crossbar, you always have to check. But is it pointing the right way? And, and, like and a good way to check is to just look at one component and figure out, should this be going up or down? Should it be positive or negative? And then check your ranges against that component. If you check the range in the upper hemisphere against the z component that we had last class, you'd realize it gave you a negative number when it should have been giving you a positive. Sort of, sort of. So you would know to just take the normal vector to be the negative. You just okay. negate that normal vector and yeah. use that as the normal. So, so the z component should have been a squared sine phi cosine phi? Yeah. The, the whole, you the whole take the negative of the whole vector. So this would have been positive. You chain the sine on the other one, chain the sine on the other one. Take the whole, the vector in the opposite direction. Okay, so basically we just, after we, we find the normal vector, we, we think about... Right, so you, you find the cross right, and then you look at it. Is it pointing yeah, the way I should want? Well, and you just look in one coordinate in one region and figure out, is it working? And if it's working there... Yeah, but we, we don't really have to draw. I mean, we can just think about, okay, it has to look like... And well, drawing is just an, an easy way to see it right away. Well, where did you mess up? Just the cross rod was in the opposite direction. Re oh, remember, you u cross v is the negative of v cross u. Okay. Right. So in my notes, I think I took r sub phi cross r sub theta, and here I did r sub theta cross r sub phi, or something like that. But I did the cross in the opposite way. But you always have to check. Is this the normal vector I want? Right. How do you it's know not you as obvious with as with the explicit form where you know, oh yeah, this is the up one. How do you right know you did correct the first time though? Huh? How do you know that you did correct the first time? The coincidence, right? I just took the cross product and then I looked at the vector and I'm like, yeah, that's the right one. And then I continued. <laughs> All right. I, I I forgot to do that one during class. So that's just another thing to look out for when you're doing the method, right? Which is just another dimension, right? So it's not a standard thing. Right, your crossbar, there's no telling if your crossbar, you did it in the right order. So you always have to check, are the components doing what they should do, and then, and then match it up. Um, I was going to show you a different way to do this, but I decided not to, because right. it's sort of dependent on the, the vector field. Um, there are times when it can be easier to just do it the explicit way and do two surfaces instead of one. I haven't seen it yet. Because, for example, in a sphere, the normal vector above and the normal vector on the bottom, they're actually very similar. They're actually the negatives of each other. So depending on your vector field, you could just negate the answer. And that would be the answer. But in this case, there are some, in this case, there was some trouble because the vector field didn't behave nicely. So um, it's, it'll be very conceptual thing. So I decided I don't want to like drag a whole class to like that. So just you do it this way. Okay? But usually it, it's a really problem because if you choose the top hat, then you, then you take the end to the square root of x squared plus y. Yes, square, if right? you chose the bottom hat, you correct the negative right. Yeah, yeah, but, but you have the derivative of that. Well, for x and y. It would give you the negative. The, the vector would be the negative. Yeah, but it's, it's and and if your vector field is nice, then all you'd have to do is negate the answer. Yeah. Right? But if your vector field does something where the signs change weird, and you can't really predict the sign change on the f, then you just you know, it's probably too much more trouble than it's worth. So that's that. So that's just something else to look out for this method, which is why I always recommend doing the other method. Can get away with it. And now we are just going to do a couple more examples, and maybe I'll introduce uh, Stokes theory. Because, right. like I said, the, the main goal of our the vector calculus part of this course was to get to the three major theorems: Green's theorem, Stokes theorem, and divergence theorem. Right, and these are the things you're going to be using in your future courses. And we got to Green's theorem early, but we just after this section is complete, we finally will have all the machinery we need for Stokes theorem and divergence theorem. So after this, that's when we're going to finish off with the two remaining theorems. And hopefully I get to Stokes theorem today. And, uh, so let's continue with the second example.
Now, it turns out that, especially in this stuff, reading is actually super important, as it always is. And you have to follow the question carefully. I realize that some people would make mistakes on questions like these because they wouldn't have count enough <coughs> surfaces. They'd be forgetting surfaces. And so we're going to talk about it. How many surfaces do we have to consider here? Two. Two. Two, right? You couldn't just do one, for example, because that would be wrong, right? What are, what are the clues that we should need two? The fact that it's the surface of a solid bounded by two surfaces. What does a solid mean? All surfaces have to be, you know, covered, right? So that's telling you if you just pick the paraboloid, then the bottom would be open, and you wouldn't be bounding a solid, right? So you need the bottom to actually cover it, right? That's one thing. All right, so this guy looks sort of like this. Right? I couldn't just use the think of the paraboloid because then the bottom would be open. It wouldn't be a, the boundary of a surface. And I couldn't just think of the cylinder because then the top would be open. It wouldn't be the boundary of a surface. So a lot of people would just do it for the paraboloid and then forget to do it for the bottom. You can't do that because the question is phrased this way. Secondly, the, how we know that we have to consider more than one surface is because they told us a positive orientation. Right? They never said, oh, the normal vectors are pointing up or the normal vectors are doing this. They said positive orientation. And remember, positive orientation was only defined for closed surfaces. So you could not have an open surface. You can't have any way to get from the inside of this object to the outside without hitting a wall. So you need to cover both the paraboloid and the bottom. So there are two surfaces here. S1, which is the one x, the z equals 4 minus x minus y squared. And then there's a second surface, S2, where your z equals 0. And you'd have to actually do this integral for both of them and then add them together. Right? So just looking at the question, you already know what you're going to have to do. I'm going to have two surfaces, and I'm going to have to do this for each one, add them together. Right? So by reading the question, you already have an idea of where you're going with it. Okay, so now let's talk about setup. Remember, we need the normal vector. How am I going to find the normal vector to S1? What general formula would we use? Well, the x is going to be the, uh, the partial root of the x. Positive orientation means the vector should be here, should be pointing out, okay. right? So it's yeah. out and out. Yeah. So now here, for S1, I want vectors pointing up. It's given explicitly, so I just want to make sure that my n has a positive 1 yeah. as the z coordinate, which means these guys have to be negative. Yeah. So that's the formula I'm going to use for this guy. This is going to be, um, fx would be minus 2x, so this is positive 2x, positive 2y. Right. That's going to be my normal vector up there. Here, I know my n should be fx, fy, negative 1, right? But your z is a constant. The partials are just 0. This is just 0, 0, negative 1, right? 
which is also obvious. It's a flat thing and it's pointing straight down. But by, yes? If you, um, if you have a pair of <coughs> spots on the surface at the How would you parameterize the bottom surface? Why would you do this? Yeah. I wouldn't do that yet. No, that has nothing to do with anything. Like, you mean if you were parameterizing this, then you'd have to find the r sub u r sub v, blah, blah, blah. and that's sort of an yeah. Yeah. You'd need x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and you find r sub r cross r sub v. It's too much work. I wouldn't do it. Right? If it's given explicitly, do this. Right? It's a lot easier, and you get the normal vector right away. No cross products, no nothing. That's a simple part of the right? If you realize that you're going to want to use polar coordinates eventually, I recommend that you don't apply that until after you set up the integral. Don't start setting that up here. Right? We're going to get to that event. Right? So we realize that we have two surfaces to worry about, and they're given explicitly. So we just use the easy formula, right? Minus fx minus fy positive 1, and down here fx fy negative. Okay? And so now we're just going to do them one at a time. Right? So for S1, what are we going to have? We are going to have, first of all, our f is going to be equal to the z. We're going to have to change that, right? Z here is 4 minus x squared minus y squared, y is, right? Your n is 2x, 2y, 1. So here, your double integral over S1 is going to be equal to the double integral over D, region projection. Uh, you dot product these, right? So it's uh, 2x times 4 minus x squared minus y squared times 2y squared plus x. Right? So it's f dot product n da. Right? I'm just using the formula. This stop with that, which means you multiply the corresponding components, add them together. Right. And now you're going to do this guy, maybe simplify a little bit. This is 8x minus 2x cubed minus 2x squared. Alright, so now how do we set up the limits on our integral? How do you set up D? I recommend polar, actually. Go to polar, right? It's so a circle, right? Which circle is this? If you set your z equals 0, you get x squared plus y squared equals 4. So raise to 2. So I know here, my D is just x squared plus y squared equals 4. And I know this because I set z equals 0. Right? So I set z equals 0, that gives me the trace in the xy plane, and I get that, which is just a circle of radius 2, and so I can set up in polar. Right? So we're going to have um, 0 to 2 pi, because it's a full circle. r goes from 0 to 2. And this here is 9x. What does x become? R cosine of theta, right? It's polar coordinates, right? And minus 2 R cubed. I'm doing this one. Cosine cubed theta minus 2 R cubed cosine theta sine squared theta plus 2 R squared sine squared theta. All that times R here. Yes. 
Uh, I took this x oh. here, right? So 8x and this x here makes 9x, 9 minus 2 times x cubed minus 2 times x times y squared plus 2 times y squared. You could so have made yourself in trouble if, if you uh, factor out one of the cosines from your negative 2r to make it into 1. You see, you have a cosine. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm gonna do that. So, ah. right, so this is our setup, right? It looks really big and nasty right here, right? <laughs> but we are gonna be able to simplify this. First of all, I know that this guy is gonna go to zero. So, just forget about it, right? Um, I believe I told you that before, right? If you integrate sine or cosine over an interval which covers the period. No, yeah, I mentioned that. I thought I you I didn't mention it, but we know about it. <laughs> Integrate from a up to a plus any multiple of two pi of sine. You always get zero. Same thing for a cosine. Is it two zero and zero or one one one? Right. The idea is you're looking at the area, right? In a full period, the area here and the area here are equal. You always get zero. Right. Same thing for cosine. Right? These two positives and this negative one, they cancel each other. So once you integrate over a full period or several periods, you'll always get zero because your positive areas will kill the negative areas. This happens for sine and cosine. So here I just see have a cosine, which I know eventually I'm going to integrate that between zero and two pi, and my r will be a constant by that time. So I know it's going to be zero, so forget about that. So my thing is already simpler. Right? So I don't even have to worry about this part. How else can we simplify this? Well, factor out when, when the cosine next to the negative 2r cubed and the negative 2r cubed. Right, so now I look here, and negative 2r cubed is a common term, and cosine is a common term. So factor out negative 2r cubed cosine theta. What would we have left? It's cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. So it's just going to be 1. Right? So that's just 1. And that takes care of these guys. Right? So all of this simplified to minus 2r cubed cosine. Right? And then we're left over that guy. 2r squared sine squared. this times r dr d So then this guy is just zero to two pi. 0 to 2 of minus 2r cubed cosine theta plus 2r squared sine squared theta <coughs> r dr d theta. Can we make it simple? <coughs> cosine theta. Apply the same thing again. This part is going to be 0. Forget it. So in the end of the day, my integral is 2r cubed sine squared theta. Right? So that huge monster over there, just by doing a little mumbo jumbo, applying trig identities, you get to here. Right? And this is why precalculus is important. Right? You don't have to do that huge mess. If you know that and you know your trig identities, that becomes this. Right? And so here you can, yeah, you can do for the easy thing. Like, sure. Um, you can split these up if you want. But you don't have to. You integrate this, you get what? R to the fourth over uh, 2, right? Yeah. Times sine squared theta between 0 and 2. So you plug in 2 and you get uh, 16 over 2, which is just 8. 
and you plug in zero and it's gone. All right, so it's just eight seven squared. How do you integrate that? Uh, use uh, double angle theorem. Huh? Double angle theorem. One half minus this is one half times one minus cosine two theta, right? The one half is going to kill this. You're going to get a four, and this would be um, one minus cosine two theta. Two theta. The period of cosine two theta is pi. You're integrating over a full period, so that part is zero. Forget it. So we really just need 4 times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 d theta, which is 8 pi. I feel like we, we could have just done like, a, like another formula. Um, because you, you I didn't see one immediately. So. You only really want <coughs> the area of a circle. Right? It ended up being there here. Um, a priority, we didn't know that. <laughs> like, I'm not going to look, oh, that's just the error of a circle. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so is that the answer, right? Yeah. Good, we're paying attention. We still have the S2, right? Remember, there are two surfaces we had to worry about. So let's do the second one. This was just z equals 0. So we know that our normal vector was 0, 0, negative 1. Our f was z comma y comma x, right? So it would be 0 comma y comma x. And so your double integral over s2 is equal to the double integral over d of f dot product of n dA double integral of this time this is 0, this time this is 0 minus x. Now we use polar coordinates again. It's the same region of projection, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 2 minus r cosine theta times r dr d theta. Integrate cosine over 0 to 2 pi with a constant in front, that's going to give you 0. <coughs> Our flux is 8 pi. Uh, is, is it true that if you take the derivative of uh, the volume of the sphere, you get the superior of the sphere? Like, like using the equation for volume of the sphere. If you look at the volume, do, differentiate with respect to what? Uh, uh, I guess so. I, I don't know. I have to, have to look at it. You should be able to tell from the formulas. So. I, mean, I heard it once, so I'm just wondering. Any questions? I mean, most of it was evaluating the integral. Any questions on Wait, the so setup? So the answer didn't change, but if you didn't show it, we have, we not have our credits. Right, you would have lost a lot of the credits. Because this doesn't have to be zero, like I say. In class, I picked nice examples. I mean, in, in general, you would get a non-zero number here that you have to actually add to that. So. All right, so that's an example where you can use the easy way to find the normal vector, but you have more than one surfaces to worry about.
So this is the next question. So what I'm thinking, right, is uh, they told me a sphere so I can just parameterize using spherical coordinates. Right? X equals, it's a unit sphere. So I can say X <coughs> equals uh, sine phi cosine theta, Y equals sine phi sine theta. <coughs> Z equals cosine phi, right? You don't need to actually. And then so do just, just use the equation for service to sphere yeah. and then by four. It's going to be by eight, actually. How do you know that your field is this? Oh, true. Yeah. Sine of eight. You don't know if you, after you dot product with the n, you get a constant, so you can yeah. say one. But does my plan sound reasonable? Do you have to do another yeah. parameterization for the, um, the xy plane? Well, that's a good question. How many surfaces do we have to deal with here? No, there's actually going to be four. Oh. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you guys, so how many surfaces? Four. Yeah, four. One, two, three. No, there's one. Why? <laughs> boundary. Oh, Read boundary. the question. Oh, that boundary. Okay. S is the part of the unit sphere in the first octet. Oh, that's Done. Yes. That's it. Oh. It never said S was the unit Solid. sphere with the xy plane and the yz plane and the xz plane. <laughs> or it never oh. said X is the boundary of the, the the ball in the, the, it never said that. It's just the unit sphere. The yeah, like only that. surface you care about is this curved part here. There's one surface. Uh, right? You know what I'm saying? Can you like bold it? <laughs> <laughs> right? You really have to pay attention to these questions because they, they don't mention anything else, only the unit sphere. So, you know, there's only one surface. And they never said it, something like the boundary of a solid. Right? Another thing, they never said it was positively oriented or negatively oriented. They said, towards the origin. So that kind of tells you you have an open surface dealing with right there. Right? So right, you pick up these key languages here. You really need to know. So you know, positive and negative oriented for in, in three dimensions deals with closed surfaces. So if they just tell you orientation is just pointing in some arbitrary direction, like everything is pointing in this direction, chances are it's not closed. Right? So be careful with that. There's really only one surface. So now, how do we attack this? We have to find the normal. So do you yeah. agree with my assessment? We just do yeah. the parameterization? But, yeah, no! No! You don't do the parameterization. Why would you do the parameterization? Explicitly. Explicit. It's the top half of the sphere. Z. I can get an explicit formula for this. Z is the positive radical. There's no bottom half to worry about. I don't have to worry about plus or minuses. There's one surface, okay. and I have an explicit <coughs> equation. I'm not going to do a cross product, especially. We actually did the cross product with cosine, phi, sine, blah, blah, blah. That was the first example. You remember how long that took? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it took Right? <laughs> no. You don't, you don't want to do something like that more than once in your life. Right? So <laughs> here, you're always looking for the easy way out. Parameterization is never the easy way out. You have to look at the thing and say, do I have to parameterize? In this case, no, right? There's only one part of the surface and it's just the positive part, right? So I definitely know that this is my explicit formula. Take this to be F. So what will my normal vectors look like? I mean, it's pointing down towards the origin. So if I have a normal vector here, they're pointing towards the origin. Right? Is that up or down? Negative, down. Negative, negative. They're all down. So it means I want negative one here, which means that the other two are positive. Right? Now to do this, or to do r of theta phi equals sine phi, cosine theta, sine phi, sine theta, cosine phi. Find the partials of that, cross product that. Right? No, this is going to be a lot easier. How do you differentiate this with respect to x? Um, 
why is the normal vector pointing inwards? Because they told us, told us. Origin. oriented oh. towards the origin. So I, I know that if I draw a normal vector on the surface, it should be pointing towards the origin, so it will be pointing down. So I know I want my z coordinate to be negative. That's my normal vector, right? I didn't have to go through that whole thing. If you look back at what we did the first example, how long it took us to get to the normal vector. This is a much nicer way. So now what do we do? We set up polar after we set up the integral, right? So first we're going to set up the integral. So the double integral over s is going to be the double integral over d. Our d is going to be this region of projection of f dot n So now I did this guy. This problem would be much nicer if the y was in the y coordinate, but I, I did this on purpose, so now I'm, I'm going to pay the price for it. If you dot product with that, you get what? Minus x squared over this. Right? And this would dot with 0, and then this would dot with y, so it's minus y. How do you set up the limits? I would recommend using polar. Polar. Um, what, what's my theta? Theta should be 0 to power of 2. 0 to power of 2. 0 to power of 2. What's the r? 0 to 1. It's the unit sphere, right? Yeah. Unit sphere means radius is 1. So b we can ignore, basically. And so this is going to be x squared would be what? <coughs> oh, I took out the negative. r squared cosine <coughs> squared <coughs> theta. <coughs> over the radical of 1 minus r squared minus r sine theta r dm. Right, so that's our integral and the rest of it is just a computer. Use up for the denominator? Yeah, for the one minus r squared. Sure. If we're going to do this, we can. And then replace all first of the. First, we write it. And then replace. We're going to inspect the r first. Um, so let's. No, I yeah, but replace it with u. So it's all for u. No, I wanted to bring that r in. Okay. This is r squared sine. I thought if I factored out, I would get something nicer. R cubed. So how do you integrate um, r cubed over one minus r squared? Can we do a trig identity? I wouldn't recommend it. Trig identity is overkill. Yeah. You have an odd power in the top. Oh. Trig identity is overkill. Oh, I see. Let me try R10. No, no, no. R10. Let's, just, R10. let's just focus on this guy first, and then we'll go back and we'll plug it in, right? R10. If you're doing this guy, how would you do it? You have an odd power, which means trig sub overkill, right? If it was even power, then we'd bite the bullet and say R equals um, one, one sine theta, right? But it's a odd power, so which means you can actually write this as r squared yeah. over 1 minus r squared times r dr, which that's going to give your u substitution. Yeah. So what I can do here is I can let u equals the radical of 1 minus r squared, which means my u squared would be 1 minus r squared, which means 2u d <coughs> equals minus 2 r dr, 
which means u d minus d u is equal to r d r. Right, so this guy here I know is going to be my minus u du. This guy here I know is going to be the u. What about this guy? That's u. That's um, <coughs> 1 minus u. Right, I know u squared is 1 minus r squared. This means that my r squared I can write as 1 minus u squared. Yeah. So the integral becomes minus 1 minus u squared over u times u du. This cancels. This integral is that. Your, your trig sub would not look very nice. And so this would be minus u plus u cubed over 3. And your u is this guy. This guy would be minus 1 minus r squared plus 1 minus r squared to 3 over 2 over 3 times cosine squared minus r cubed over 3 sine between 0 and 1. This is sort of exciting. So let's continue this guy over here. And so now if I plug in 1, I get 0, right? Here I get minus 1 third sine. Well, there's a negative on the outside. I mean, like, which part is positive? When we factor out the negative, shouldn't that be? Plus sign. Plus sign. On the on top. Uh, where? You see uh, our sign theta? Should we plus our sign theta since you factor out the negative? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, here. Yes. So it's um, one third sine theta, right? Minus. Now, if I plug in r equals <coughs> zero, what do I get? I would get minus one. Plus one third times the cosine squared. So this is just minus the integral from 0 to the power of 2 of 1 third sine theta. Minus 1 plus a third is minus 2 thirds. Cosine squared, how do we deal with that? Just one half one plus cosine two theta. And so now we can actually start integrating these guys. So it's minus one third cosine theta. Uh, integral of sine is minus cosine plus um, theta over three. Plus one over six. Sine. Are we okay? Uh, why, is, why is one over six? Uh, integral of cosine two theta is one half 
sine yeah. 2 theta you sub times this third, you, one third. You sub on the 2 theta, so. Yeah, you, you sub on the 2 theta. And so now if I plug in power of 2, cosine power of 2 is what? Zero. And then you plug in power of 2 here, you get pi over 6. Plus, um, if you plug in here, you get zero. So you just have pi over 6 minus Now you plug in zero. And I don't think that was the answer I got when I was here. Yeah, maybe there's a mistake somewhere? Uh, possibly. Uh, maybe the negative? <laughs> no, I don't think there was a pi in my answer. It would need to be there because you have a cosine squared theta in, in, in your integral. So, even so, no matter what, you would have to have some pi in there. Uh, I don't think I had a pi from what I remember. Yeah, it would have to have a pi because of the, co the cosine squared. It would have to. Check this. <coughs> you, you don't keep your notes on you? Or? No, I don't bring the solution, I just bring the question. <laughs> uh, but we have this, and so far we were correct up to here, right? And That's so positive. then x squared, we factor out the negative, which made both of these positive. r squared cosine squared, r sine. 1 minus r squared, r. Draw this r and I get r cubed over r squared. Alright, then I had to figure out the integral of this guy. The integral of this guy was just r cubed over 3. That was fun. Integral of this guy, we went over here. u equals this, u squared equals that, 2 d equals that, minus d equals that. R squared equals 1 minus u squared. U, 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 u cancel, 1 minus u squared. U minus u cubed over 3. And the u was this guy to the half. This, this. So far we're OK. Question? Yeah. How is R D R U D U? Is that just? Yeah, th this is fine. Okay. All right, because I'm using this equation. Differentiate both sides. All right. Derivative of u is two u. Derivative of this is minus two. Okay. And I plugged in the negative. There. Negative. Yeah. You know, yeah, I put the negative out here. Negative out here. I distributed it here. Yeah, so you get to here. Okay, and that looks fine. So plug in one. Plug in one, I get zeros, and that kills that. And then I would get a third sum. Plug in zero, and I would get minus one plus a third times cosine, and that does. That's it. Already yeah. minus one six sine two pi. Uh, okay. Hold on, I'm getting I'm getting there. This is <coughs> so now we're up to here, and I think we're fine. Up here. I didn't see a mistake. And so this is one third sine minus one plus a third is uh, minus two thirds times this guy. 
this guy is one half, one plus blah. Wait, one half. One half. Okay, one half. I see, I see, I see. Never mind. Right, and then I integrated this with respect to theta. Integrate this with respect to theta. Integrate this with respect to theta. Pleasure. Yep. Right here, when you put the one minus one minus uh, one minus zero, is that uh, a square root negative one minus r squared going to be zero, and it's going to be a one there? Yeah. Right here. When that? you plug in zero, yeah, you would get one radical of one, right? Which is just minus one. Yeah. And then here you get one to the zero over two, which is just one third. That looks fine. Maybe you Maybe I changed the uh, maybe I changed the Wait, region. Why did you have the sign? The here, the, the the negative. You still have the negative there. And and you put I d I don't recall a power of six being in my answer. I don't know. I don't see a mistake, but um, we'll look I'll look at it again. Huh? <coughs> Where did you get the one thing? Because it's, it's a sign of 2 pi, pi over 2. Zero. Shouldn't that be the zero, yeah. I got this from the second guy, right? When I plugged in 0 into the cosine. Oh, okay. That gave me 1, and then I have the minus of 1. And then these two are good. But that's, that's it. That's 13.7. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll finish it 30 with I know, right?